All right. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so, so now time for something uh, completely different um, and to get you all working on this one. So I guess this is sort of inspired by you know, having set up a, a dedicated unit from scratch. I've sat on a hell of a lot of Intel for You panels interview, and interviewed a whole load of people to populate a research computing team. And really, you know, we, we often ask, a, basically there's two questions that probably the, the things which I, 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 that resonate in my mind about kind of is this going to be a really good fit within in the research computing team? One's actually the diversity inclusion question, right? And the other one is on is is around is this somebody that can actually hold a conversation with an academic? I'll often turn to the turn to the academic panel member as saying, you know, of these of these people who we interviewed, which one would you look forward to having a conversation with? Okay, and that ultimately is, you know, and then, you know, we, we take the risk on the technical side, right? But, because we, but those things, how to develop these relationships effectively, uh, and this first contact is, is absolutely vital um, in terms of building the relationship and credibility of a, a research computing um, team. And I think, you know, Sarah kind of alluded to it yesterday about this whole, you know, I don't like to be told how to do my job, right? And I think this whole, you know, you, you have, you're dealing with people that, you know, in that like itty bitty thing, which is their specialism, they are the world expert at that thing. And then, you know, when it comes to anything else in their professional lives, you know, no one's really gonna tell them how to do their job, right? And so how do you actually have this kind of, how do you gain this kind of level of influence with people to help them kind of along their way, have a, you know, construct things so you really have an adult, adult conversation with um, academics. You're an expert in what you do, they're an expert uh, in what they do. So this is all about first contact, right? Um, you know, so the question that I often ask is something like, you know, a user contacts you and says, is something wrong with the computer? Um, you know, it doesn't work, right? What do you do? And people who basically say, oh, well, I'll start to really dissect the problem and I'll go into this technical detail and I'll reduce it to the fundamentals of the universe or whatever and I'll build it all up from first principles and it'll all kind of work in the end because everything will work. For I kind of go, oh, right, you're solutionizing it. That's, that's kind of not, not the way forward. But the person who says, I'll probably, I'll probably just go and try to talk to them and over a cup of tea, I'll just ask them, what is it that you're actually trying to do, right? And try to, in, try to sort of unpick the, pick things a little bit. Though, though that's kind of, like, oh, right, and we see how where that kind of conversation goes. And so this session is all about how do we do, construct these kind of, what we're gonna call an intake interview, that first contact. Um, we're gonna have a go at practice. No idea how this is gonna work, and um, particularly online. So I think we do have some academics online, which hopefully, on my instruction right now, while we do the rest of the introduction, they're going to kind of put them on tables and all various things so that people online can actually go and do the intake interview practice. And we have several people who would identify as academics who don't have to role play. And if anyone fancies doing role play as kind of pretending to be an academic, right, um, feel free because we probably have less academics than we have tables within the room. Um, Okay, and then if it is proving successful, hopefully we'll stop a little bit early and maybe anything that emerges, good approaches that people observe and other, other things can kind of be kind of reflected within the room. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Alison now, who's gonna take you through the, the whole inter intake interview process. So um, here's what the goal is, it, you know, absolutely the first thing you need to do is to figure out what the problem is, and to start to come up with a plan towards a solution. You're not going to finish that plan in that single interview unless it's a very, very small task, but um, this is just the start of the process. It's the start of building a relationship. So here's a goal. So I'm going to turn this to you now. What questions do you ask? There'll be people here who have loads more experience than I do in this. Um, has anyone got a killer question that they ask in, in this situation? When they're meeting an academic for the first time who has come to them with a problem. Anyone? Anyone online? Chris? 
I'd start with their interest in you know, what's their research question. Why, why are we having this conversation to begin with? What are they trying to do? Yep, that's a really good start, yeah. Anyone else? Any online, Nick? Uh, who will benefit from this? Who will benefit? Yeah. Cool. Any more? What are you doing at the moment and why isn't that what you, you know, and how does that relate to what we're talking about here, right? So yeah. where do you want, where are you starting from? Great, thank you. Any more? Any online at all? Okay, we'll move on then. So this is a list, um, not compiled by me, of some, some good sort of things that you need to try and get out of that first interview. So you said the first thing to do is to ask about their research. And as we saw yesterday, a lot of academics, they really want you to be like completely engaged and on board with their research. And I have to say, from my experience, usually when they start talking about their research, they're so enthusiastic that I pick up on that and I become just as enthusiastic as, as they are, even if I don't understand half of what they, what, what's going on. Uh, <laughs> I still, I think it's it's really, I, I find it's something I find quite easy to do is to, to enthuse about, about what they're doing because there's just so much interesting stuff out there. Um, the point is to, to not rush. Um, today we might have to go a little bit quickly so that everyone gets a chance to, to do this, but um, in, in real life, Take your time. Take your time to make sure that you're understanding each other. Um, identifying the problem that's been solved. So it's like, what do you want? And sometimes I found that, depending on who I'm talking to, especially sort of sometimes in the humanities, someone wants a website and they want it to be interactive, but they don't actually know what the interactivity is going to look like. And sometimes that can take quite a lot of teething out. Um, and then we have to try and sort of turn what they're saying into sort of computing terms um, and so sort of partly sort of repeating it back and sort of figuring out what from a technical point of view the work is talk to them ask them how what, what how they think the problem should be solved you might not agree but um, it might give a starting point that you can sort of use as a, a basis for, for for how you sort of adjust how you plan the work Assessing their ability again. You talk to so many. Different, we talk to so many different people across different departments. Sometimes someone from a background that you would not expect to be really technical has a load of technical knowledge about something that you is unexpected. Other times, um, someone's a lot less um, technically minded in this in a particular area than you might um, imagine. And then finally, this follows on from what Martin was saying yesterday. Said so identifying assumptions and. Sometimes that's those sort of issues about terminology that Martin mentioned. Um, but yeah, sort of what are you assuming that they already know? What are, you, what are they assuming that you can do? So try, and, try and pin those down. And yeah, I think this goes both ways. Explain it to me like I'm 12. Get them to explain their research to you in those terms. And maybe you can explain what your plans are in those sorts of terms as well. Um, it's really important to sort of check that you're, um, you're understanding that you're on the same lines. Again, let's sort of try and make sure that you've not got this fundamental understanding about a particular term that you use in one technical way, they use in a um, sort of domain specific way, things like that. Um, so sort of repeating what they're saying, but paraphrasing rather than repeating in exactly the same words. And that will then say, they can sort of say, oh no, it's not quite like that. Or, um, or they'll sort of agree that you've got it. Um, Keep asking questions to just nail things down, to narrow, narrow down the scope of what, what, things, what, what you're talking about. And also just being able to say no to some things. Um, this is hard, um, especially, you know, some of us are in sort of groups that are sort of growing and you want to take on work, but then sometimes you just don't have that capacity and you need to find a way of saying, well, we can do it, but possibly not till, not for another few months, or actually that's just not feasible. Um, and you want to do that without annoying anyone because you're trying to build this group up and you don't want to like, spoil the reputation. I think this is, this is also is, you know, if they're asking for the impossible, right, but you, you don't want to say no, you want to say, well, maybe if we try this and have a go, we might end up figuring out what might work in this kind of area. So kind of not actually just saying we can absolutely deliver this 
but maybe if we try something Andy. Well, I guess the other thing, I mean, we experience a bit with this. The other thing is you, you, have, to be, you have to be honest in some ways and say, you know, that's something that's not possible in the way you imagine it because what you're actually fundamentally trying to do here is build trust and build a relationship where the academics trust you and you trust them. Um, and you, I think you're better to say, you know, this isn't something we can help you with, but, and then maybe point them to people who can than to try and grab all the work. I mean, certainly that's the approach we tried to take in the past, and I think it's served us pretty well, is you become a trustworthy advice. You know, when you come to you, you're not s just about selling your services and getting your money in for your project. You have to build that trust relationship. Otherwise. And then they'll come back and say, well, actually, okay, you can't help me with that project, but your advice was good and we got stuff there, so you can help me with this project maybe, you know, and I think that's key, that trustworthiness. Thank you. Um, so we've sort of talked about some of the things you could do in an interview. I think, I think sort of some of it is just something that will come with practice, and that's why we're doing that practice today. Um, but at the end of that interview, we need to sort of make sure that everyone knows what's happening next and when you're going to follow up on that. And I just want to go a bit beyond that first interview as well, um, because you unlikely, unless it's a very small thing. I mean, I'm talking from an RSE perspective here. Um, I have to admit, I don't know what it's like for, for sort of HPC things, and you know, it might be slightly different for a small query on how to run something on, on, on a HPC service, but for, from our point of view as RSEs, and, um, you're not gonna get everything from that first interview. You're gonna have to iterate and figure out a bit more about what they need. So yeah, emailing who's doing what next. But I think for the bigger tasks, um, I think it's really important to sort of write down the work that you're agreeing to do. And um, if you're doing, writing some software that's going to be end users are going to use, um, one thing that I try and frame it as is like what's called user stories, um, which is like as a member of the public, I want to come to this website and do X, Y, or Z, or as an administrator of this system, I want to be able to do something else. And um, I think sometimes that's the sort of perspective that it can sometimes be hard for researchers to, to think about. They can sort of th see a bigger picture, but actually that detail of who wants to do what with, with some software that you're building um, can, can be hard to pin down. And I, I do find that user stories are a good way of doing that. Um, and I think also sort of putting those in sort of a shared document to make it easy for other people to comment rather than just threads of emails, um, I think is, is another good way of, of doing that. Um, other things you can do is sort of just try and prioritize things or help the academics to prioritize. And part of that can just be sort of saying, well, this is a really big task. This is a smaller task, it's a medium task. And then that can help them to sort of determine which are the most important tasks for, for, for or the, what's the best set of tasks that you should try and try and do first at least. And finally to sort of iterate, keep going through this process because things change as you start work. Sometimes things change and we just need to make sure that everyone's aware of of where everyone's up to and what the sort of requirements are and, and if the requirements change that, that everyone's got a, a note of that. Um, I think that's everything I was going to say. Uh, we've got activity but has anyone got any other comments or questions before we move on to that? I think one thing I miss there is talking about time scales. Where the, when do you need the standby uh, how long do you think somebody should work on this? Do you have the money for that? Yeah, that's another really important thing. Yes, so that I missed that wasn't on the list, but yeah, that's absolutely an important thing is whether they've got funding, whether they've got funding for an RSE time or and yeah, how long it might take. And that's that's where sometimes that sort of list of priorities you can say, well, okay, they can afford this much time um of an RSE. So how much can we fit into that time and, and how do we prioritize that? Thank you. Um uh, mine is a little bit in that direction. Uh, where is the borderline between uh, the initiation of the contact with the researchers where you try to figure out what they want and when you are starting to actually plan the project? Because this here this seems to be a little bit fuzzy. The transition seems that you go straight from, hello, my name is X, to, yeah, we have this plan with this timeline, let's start in three months. <laughs> no, so I mean, obviously this is just the follow-ups that I mentioned previously. That was sort of... Um, something that takes the time that's what i was saying it's a process of you have to iterate you have to go through go through that process and it can take depending on how fast people are at getting back it can take 
weeks, actually months on one project that I'm on, <laughs> someone who sort of talked to us last summer about uh, a grant application they were putting in, and I think they sort of keep getting distracted from it and keep coming back to us with more questions, and I think we're still waiting for that. But I think that's, again, that has to be driven by, by their timelines and, and, and when when you might have, have time to fit it in. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process, I think. Um, so today, the practice is more about that initial contact and that sort of building the relationship. Um, but I just wanted to touch a little bit on some of that follow-ups and, and, and where you go from there as well. Any more questions? Yeah, I know um, you've mentioned Sarah a couple of times in your, your session this morning. I've got Sarah online. Are you all right if I ask her to, to join you on stage and speak to the room? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, right. by all means. Bear with me, because this may not work. <laughs> so, Sarah, I think we can hear you. I think you're live in the room. Oh, fantastic. Well, lovely to see everybody again. Sorry I can't join you in person today. So I just wanted to, um, to say I don't really think that my comment was interpreted as I meant it. I would, I, so the advice I won't take is about um, my research direction, but I certainly, certainly take advice from experts and I rely extremely heavily on that type of expertise. And I, I would, I mean, I tell him every other day, but I, you know, I would say that Alan was one of the most important people who had helped me in my career, given how much he's helped me understand and, and introduced me to a community of other technical experts. And I would also say that one of the things that I do in my molecular simulation course is I have a slide that explains the relationship between the users and um, the systems administrators and the people who look after our HPC and our codes. And I advise the students that they should really revere those people because they really, really do control your access to HPC. So I just wanted to, um, to make that slight clarification. Um, so thank you very much. So I'm gonna follow up on this, right? <laughs> um, in the, you know, I, I at the time I was in an IT department, okay, and I could have very much gone in with a, you know, very authoritarian attitude and basically says, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, do this, da, da, da. and it was, you know, that would have gone down really, really, really badly and I would not have been able to even have a second meeting with Sarah, right? Oh, that's true, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I think this is, you know, but so it's really important to get off on the right foot. Okay. And this is what this is all about. <laughs> okay. Um, Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. I have to say, you, you know, I mean, your support has been extremely important to me and continues to be so. Do we have any, thank you, Sarah. Do we have any other questions or comments either online or in the room? Or are we ready to move on to the activity? The activity? Go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything could happen. So, um, Nikki. I think there's, it, there's a handful of questions and I'm, I'm, I'm going to rattle through a couple of them. Uh, questions are really helpful. But uh, typically the queries where they, what they ask for is impossible and what the academics need uh, is guidance on what is feasible rather than what uh, exactly perhaps what they need. So there needs to be a lot of discussion to sort out a best path forward and that's where you need a lot of care and tact. Um, and you don't want a PhD student to panic as a result of that thinking their entire project's in jeopardy. Um, I think that's the, the main one from there. Um, <laughs> But yeah, also encouraging ECRs and PhDs to ask for help rather than struggling on heroically. I think that is that at that point there is actually really important, right? Because the whole academic training is about solving problems and often doing it in isolation and making your own position unique to, as the self for the academic career and all that sort of stuff and being self-sufficient in that way. And I think that is a barrier sometimes to people. We see that a lot with people, you know, we, people say, oh, I didn't raise a um, service desk query because, you know, I thought I just had to go, go ahead and solve it. You're like, we're here, you're paid to help you. That's our, literally our job. You know, and getting past that, past that attitude of it in academia is a big, 
is a problem sometimes and get saying you know it's not weakness and it doesn't show you in a bad light to be able to ask for help and to bring expertise in from other places yeah yeah just sort of follow up on that we often get people who are sort of like oh sort of a bit nervous about talking to us because they sort of like see us as knowing everything and, and that they don't don't know enough to to, to to have this conversation even and i think it's just sort of reassuring them they're experts in their field you know what you're talking about in your field and just it doesn't matter that their their knowledge is um it's not not where they think it needs to be and actually um sometimes you find that those people actually know more than than they first admit yeah, and i think some of the most difficult conversations are actually the ones where people have got a very specific preconceived idea that actually you need to change so they say i know how to do this does i just need to log in and i can do it and i'll be fine or whatever it is uh, and actually it's like oh it's a little bit different here compared to there or whatever and just trying to kind of get things in a um you know sort of especially when you know they, they come with a lot of expertise it's actually really sometimes very difficult i think this this thing Got anything else? Any other comments, or should we move on? Yeah, just another one from Sarah, just to say that the ticketing systems, obviously, they're really great from a documentation and traceability issue, but sometimes they can be a barrier for people, and y you know, they get in the way of that relationship that you sometimes need to actually progress a project. Yeah, certainly, um, you know, when I, when I was working with Sarah back in Leeds, you know, I, I, often um, there were I, sort of, once a particular academic's teaching load had kind of ended, I always got an email basically saying, you know, and, and I knew it was just a reply to the last one, because he, you know, you were the last helpful person that replied to me kind of thing. Um, and it would basically be, can you remind me how to use this supercomputer again? Because I finally have some time to do some research because I've just been involved in teaching for so long. And I'd go along to his office, say, you just do this, it's all fine, bang. And then he'd be okay for the next six months. <laughs> but I had to kind of remind him of how to do these things. Matt and, well, Marion and then Matt. So, your, your comment just reminded me of something. Um, we have been working online for the last two years, uh, and how does doing these intake interviews online correspond to doing them in person? Is there anything different about doing it in the two different contexts? I can't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, actually, I've probably done more online now than uh, in person because I was in the job for six months before the pandemic. Um, so actually we've done a lot more as a group um, online than we have in person and I think actually I think we've managed to build those relationships pretty well I think sometimes I realize that oh yeah I haven't actually met you in person yet and I've been working with this person for sort of you know a year or two um, so I think it can work sort of just as well um, in, in a lot of cases um, yeah it would be nice to sort of go and meet people again but I think in terms of the effectiveness of this I think it can can work just as well online yeah, just um, a comment also on the relationships and so what I find really helpful um, to build this is um, giving the training courses because this is often the first point of contact um, that we have with the users or with people who are potentially interested in using our um, services, our machines and so. So there will always be a last slide that then basically explains to them what else we offer and how to contact us and so and um, sometimes there will be people who will then email half a year later as, as um, <laughs> Ellen said oh yeah now I finally want to use Hamilton our supercomputer and so um, I've forgotten after your course can you send me the slides again and um, that can then actually um, be quite a quite a useful starter again to to start this relationship and then maybe even talk about um, further support work. Thank you. Can I just uh, speak as a PhD student, as a potential new user, and uh, what I feel the biggest barrier for new user, but just the most, mo for not just for myself, is uh, kind of knowing what the capacity and are available, you know, to support us uh, to answer our research question as well as deal with our data. 
that's kind of uh, one of the biggest uh, barrier because we can't even articulate our needs from your side. So what may you all kind of things you can put in to kind of help us to articulate our needs, you know, make us known what are available out there uh, can support our research. That would be uh, very beneficial and really kind of bring down the barrier for new users uh, from our subject as well. Thank you. So I'm going to say thank you very much for identifying like a PhD student that's sort of a user side of things. So you're going to be interviewed. <laughs> so anybody who basically is a user, um, please in the room, like raise their hand and probably or and, and get to and basically we probably need to split you up over various tables so that then people who identify as um, kind of the support people, the RSEs, the um, yeah can kind of be part of the interviewers. Does that does that work? So how many users? Have we got in the room? One, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten. Amazing. Eleven, maybe even. So we probably. Um, I think we we might want to want to spread out across the both areas. Um, so if 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 people who want to be interviewed, go and take some places um, at tables, and then other people who uh, the rest of us can can join and have a go <laughs> at, at getting to know academics that we've never ever met before <laughs> and then once the conversation fizzles out we'll, we'll rotate and, and, and see what happens so good luck everyone <laughs> have fun just to say i think um nick and rebecca have been trying to sort out so that people online can do something similar uh, is that all sorted great right. so hopefully you'll get your instructions online thank you <laughs>
wants to put their flag up and maybe comment from from that side of things. It'd be really cool if someone volunteers. But no one will put their hand up, I guess. Oh, you can't just pick somebody that you can do in the room. It's all right. I can talk, Alan, to save everybody. So um, we did have a round the table discussion Ooh. about situations that have gone badly. So, um, you know, I recounted some of the conversations I had that have gone badly that were very often to do with, um, normally they were with um, IT rather than research IT, but there were things like, you know, them asking me to pay £1,000 for a tiny amount of storage and I don't have any money and, um, it, you know, situations in which maybe IT is sometimes aggressive and have very long timescales for things that are going to slow my research down, like installing Linux on any machines and things like that. And there were some um, examples from the um, research IT experts as well, talking about when researchers were doing bad things with unlicensed software that causes problems and also data provenance. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so shall we move back into the room now? Um, I think there were, Anybody want to volunteer? Well, I'm going to volunteer somebody or other to come in. Well, I'm going to volunteer Simon because he came and said, this was really good observation that we had. So if we get a microphone to Simon. Okay, yes. Uh, do you want to stand up? We've got two RICs here. So what happened, because I know I'm on camera here, is that um, we sat down and tried to start out doing uh, a practice kind of interview just to see how it worked and how it um, what problems and things might come along I've not done this before at an RSE level so I was really interested we've got a very nice um, PhD student and librarian here who has a real problem so we started talking about that and this is in library and humanities which none of us started out being very good at but between the RSEs and talking about the technologies um, had a really good conversation starting completely diametrically opposed areas. Um, me from a very science background, um, humanities and library on the other side. Um, but during our discussion, um, we managed to explore what was wanted, the technologies that might be used, um, ideas we had about uh, what would be possible, making links with our other academics um, in terms of support for machine learning to add to this project and uh, uh, the use of, for example, uh, web crawlers, which was the technology that first came up. So I think we've done a whole little introductory session here and we've got a project coming out of it. So as the customer, would you say? Mm, I find it's quite useful with uh, the way it helped me to articulate my needs a little bit more and understanding your capacity as well. And uh, the other uh, important thing I think is kind of know the networker as well, who I should and two, if I have questions and uh, who or uh, which network I should be in to get more support and information, I think uh, that's very important is find the right path, <laughs> if I put that way. <laughs> Thank you. And from the RSC point of view? Um, so also coincidentally, it turns out that the uh, researcher in question is from Sheffield and I'm also from Sheffield, so it, it did descend into more of an actual session rather than a mock session. Uh, so going forwards, there might be some actual work that comes out of this, which would be cool. Um, but yeah, that's just very coincidental as always happens at these events. Yeah, well, uh, Imperial doesn't have any any humanities side, so it was uh, pre pretty far from the kind of things that projects we typically scope. I think it, were, it was very useful for me, at least, to uh, find out what sort of technologies other people that is not in the field we normally work with use. And also, I also pick a few ideas of actually when we are n not able to solve the problem, what we can do to 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 help these researchers, like putting them into contact with other researchers, so serving as, serving as links uh, for collaborations. I then thought that uh, we could serve like that, uh, for example, linking people within the computing department uh, that might be interested in machine learning stuff that we might not be able to, to touch or that might uh, result into research projects by themselves, uh, not something that we are helping with, but rather just we are we crystallize or help to crystallize. So I think it was really useful uh, from 
very several fronts from from me too. And uh, the other thing, I'm trying to be here today as well as want to raise a little bit profile about humanities. And uh, I really wish all you here kind of go back speak to the people who work in humanities uh, from your institutions because I think there are some needs there and uh, there are kind of some new research direction as the project uh, who may find difficult to talk to you. But if you try to approach them and ask what they are trying to do and uh, how you may help them to do the job, and I think it will be very, very useful. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming along to the conference because you're a refreshing uh, example of something we're not quite used to. So it's been really good having you here. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, just picking up on something that came up there, I heard some other conversations along similar lines uh, about sort of how perhaps um, you know, we might be the first point of call, but actually sometimes what we might need to do is, is point people, signpost people to other groups in the universities, things like, things like the libraries teams, things like the research data management teams. And I think, I think it's really important um, as sort of RSE, HPC groups that we're aware of what else is on in the university because sometimes um, we might be the first person that, that someone contacts, but actually um, we need to be aware of what they do so that we can point them in the right place and, and vice versa as well. Uh, are there any other uh, people in the room who'd like to give some feedback on, on how their discussions went? Or anyone else online? Any further comments? It's quite a conference to follow. It is. It was so good. <laughs> I think actually it's 12 o'clock. Okay, so I think it's lunchtime. So, but, but thank you very much, everybody. I think we all deserve a massive round of applause for just getting through that and it being, surviving it. So brilliant, thank you.